Emotional bonds and the unimaginable terror of hand-to-hand -hand combat and muddy trenches and godforsaken places are only a small part of John Boyne's First World War love story called The Absolutist. Award-winning Boyne was born in Dublin and continues to create amazing stories in his home country. His international bestseller, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, became a movie. He's left his younger readers behind in his most recent novel, The Absolutist. It is my pleasure to welcome John Boyne to Studio 4 to tell us more. Good morning. When I say you've left your younger readers behind, even older readers read Striped Pajamas. They did. I mean, uh, I've always been, I think, the kind of writer that doesn't like to exclude readers. And uh, when I started writing first, the early novels I wrote were novels which I think could have been read by teenagers as well as adults. And mm -hmm. then the children's books I write can generally be read by adults as well. So I, I like to kind of move between the two and, you know, just mm -hmm. write what appeals to me. So before Harry Potter, there was you. Well, I, no, actually, I think, I think she got there first. But, <laughs> Did she? Okay. Yeah. But your, uh, your beginnings, I think you wrote a lot of short stories. Uh, I did, yeah. The entertainment jar, yeah. things like that. Yeah, most of my early work, certainly as a teenager and in my early 20s, was, mm -hmm. was short stories. I, mean, I think that's, I mean, I love short stories. In many, many ways, they're more difficult to write than novels, um, I, I, I find. Why? But just because, you know, in a small amount of words, to get, a, to get across like 3,000 words, to get a real story, an emotional mm. story, something that's going to move and engage the reader, it's very, very difficult. If you have 100,000 words to play with, you can, you have a bit more freedom, mm -hmm. I think. But a short story is very difficult. I mean, there are some great short story writers. I mean, here in Canada, I mean, yes, Alice, Monroe, Alice Monroe, Margaret Atwood. Um, mm. In America, you've got Tobias Wolfe. Um, you know, great short story writers. In Ireland, William Trevor. But um, yeah, I started that way really because I, I think you can learn the craft quite well. You can finish something. And for any mm. new writer, the, uh, the feeling of finishing something is very important. When do you know for you it's finished? Whatever you're working on, be it uh, The yeah. Absolutist or uh, uh, Noah Barleywater Runs Away, yeah. when do you know? Is it's, it a it's, feeling? Yeah, it's just instinctive. You know, I think, I think so much of writing is instinct. You know uh, when the idea seems like the right idea to start mm -hmm. writing, something that's going to, you can take two years to write about. Um, you know when it's finished. I mean, what I tend to do anyway is for each draft, you know, I'll print out each draft and scroll all over it and feed in all those changes. And only when I've printed a draft where I have nothing left to scroll do I, do I show it to somebody. But, right. but it's all, I think it all comes from mm -hmm. the gut, really. And stellar writers, as you know so well, write and rewrite and write and rewrite yes. and write and rewrite. And finally, yeah. it's there. I don't know any writer of great renown who writes once. The, o the only writer I have ever heard of who published her first novel, her first drafts, was Muriel Spark. Really? Now, whether that's true or not, I'm not sure, but that's what I heard. Mm. But other than that, I mean, writing is all about the rewriting, that it's, the first draft is generally nonsense, you know. <laughs> it's, just, it's just building mm. a, a structure, mm -hmm. a story, because when I start, I don't really know what the whole story is going to be. You know, I know the, the basic idea. I know what I'm writing about and why I'm writing it. But I don't know how those characters are going to develop until I actually put words into their mouth and put them in scenes. Mm. So when I finish that first draft, then finally I know what the book is. And then I can go back and, and really start writing it. And how about your friend John Irving? He doesn't start writing until he knows what the last sentence of the novel yeah. is. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's very unusual. But I mean, every writer works differently like mm -hmm. that. Yes, John Irving, he won't begin the novel until he knows that. And then he, he works his way backwards from that. But um, I mean, you, you talk, I, I talk to writers at festivals and writers who are mm -hmm. friends, and everybody has a completely different way mm -hmm. of working. And it's, it's always very interesting to me to hear. When you finish, who, or when you're in the middle, who do you let read what you've written? Nobody. Nobody. Nobody at all. The only person who hears um, anything from, about the book while I'm writing it is my dog. Because I, I read out the, you know, I write at home mm -hmm. and I read the scenes aloud after I've written them to hear, you know, how the rhythm of the language is working. And the only person there to listen to that is my dog who's sitting see. on the floor. But because he can't that, talk back. He well, can he never wolf. says anything. So, you what know, kind of dog? He's a little King Charles Spaniel. A little King Charles. Yeah. How great. And I know yeah. you have a partner who's an engineer. Do yes. you let him read anything? No, not until... No. I, I don't like anybody to read it until it's actually mm. in book form. There's something about the legitimacy of, 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 of a book being bound up in, mm -hmm. in covers that makes it better. Sure. And first, there is always an idea, a yeah. dream, a vision. So, the absolutist. What sparked this? Well, Aside this, from the Great War. <laughs> well, it started really a few years back when I was watching a news report um, on the BBC about a town in England where a monument was being erected to soldiers from that town 
who had lost their lives in the Great War, and their names were being etched onto this mm -hmm. monument. And descendants of those soldiers were there to talk about their ancestors. But there was a second group present, and they were the descendants of people who had either uh, been shell-shocked in the trenches and deserted and been shot, or had been conscientious objectors and been shot. Most of these boys were you know, 18, 19 years old. They were just kids. You know, they hadn't lived their mm -hmm. lives at all. But they had been, their lives had ended so young as well. Conscientious ob objectors shot by their own. Yes. Not by the enemy. No. Shot by their own. Um, but, you know, oftentimes, I mean, for a conscientious objector, you could, you, could, you could make your case to a military tribunal board and you would probably be sent to prison. But if, as in my story in The Absolutist, if you were already conscripted, if you were, if you were out there in Belgium or France, if you were fighting, and if something happened to make you say, I'm putting my guns down, that's technically mm -hmm. desertion and you'll be shot for it. So, but we know now, of course, what the trenches were like, or, or mm -hmm. you know, we've read about yes, it anyway. We've read about it. And they did, what they wouldn't have understood then was the emotional effect, the trauma of being there. Mm -hmm. And so soldiers, young boys would have lost their lives because of this. And their sacrifice was not being uh, marked in any way. And these descendants were very emotional about this. And it occurred to me that I'd read, you know, I've always been interested in the First World War. I've read a lot of novels about the First World War. But this was a part of it that I had never read about. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about conscientious objectors. I didn't know much about their sacrifice. I thought I could write about that. Hence the title. Yes, well, the absolutist was a term which I wasn't familiar with at the start. But the more research I did, I learned that there were conscientious objectors who were maybe sent to work on farms or work in field hospitals or, or, or whatever. But there were some who would do nothing to further the war effort, who would just a blanket mm -hmm. refusal. And they were called absolutists. And there is one boy in the book who becomes an absolutist. But the narrator of the book, Tristan, is not so much interested in the politics of the war, but he is very emotional, very romantic, very, he's lost with, in this love affair that he finds himself in. And he's very much an absolutist in that sense, that his emotions completely take him over. And it, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's all or nothing for him. Yes, and Tristan, a young man, uh abandoned by his family really at some mm. level and uh, signs up and lies about his age. He is so anxious yes. to fight for the country. Yeah, and uh, well, yes, and the where, I mean, I've read a lot about young guys, you know, 16-year-olds mm. who, who, who would have done that, who, who would have lied. I think Tristan isn't so much in, interested in fighting for his country as he is in finding a family of some sort because he has been exiled from his own family, because mm -hmm. he has no real life of his own in London and where is it, 1916, Yes. Um, he's looking for something. He's looking to belong to something. And he finds that in the army. He finds a group of people who will tell him what to do, tell him where to go, tell him how to act. And, and that's what he wants. He feels, he feels like he belongs somewhere for the first time. So summarizing the absolutist in a sentence or two. Uh, in a sentence or two, I suppose it's about a young man who... <laughs> Hard question, right? Whose life... Who, who tells a story. Question. Well, it's a difficult question, but mm -hmm. who tells a story from the end of his life and looks back to a moment mm -hmm. in time that has traumatized his entire existence, that from which he has never been able to find love, has never been able to find any kind of life because of one single act he committed during the First World War, for which he feels great remorse and shame. Mm -hmm. And as you know, then I doubt they had post-traumatic stress counselors, anybody to uh, psychologically work with the soldiers who came home although they were received well, unlike a Vietnam soldier, mm. uh, they weren't sent to counseling, I Not so much, think. but I, I don't know if you've read Pat Barker's fantastic trilogy of war novels, Regeneration no. was the first one. And uh, there, is, there is large sections in that about uh, doctors at the time who were starting to get interested in psychology, mm. and, in, in, and, and some of the soldiers were being brought there, but in society it wasn't really being mm. taken seriously. It was, there was very much a feeling of, you're back, just get on with it, get on with your, your jobs. When you were doing your research, uh, you got the lingo down so well of the time. Yeah. And I'm thinking about one a minor character in the book, but he was, uh, I think he owned the pub. Yes. Or he was drinking uh, he's in drinking, the pub. He's a, a he man was, drinking in the pub. That's yes. right, he's drinking in the pub and he's talking uh, to you, uh, your main guy, yeah. Tristan. And uh, he says something like, I can tell where anybody, as you say something, I can tell where you were born and I can intuit who, what's in your brain and all of that. And then uh, when they've had a pint or two, he says, the missus, 
will have my guts for garters if I don't get home. Yeah. Well, because I've written a lot of books set in the past, what I generally start with is actually reading novels which were written at the time that my novel is set. So I don't actually start with nonfiction because okay. what I'm looking for is to find okay. that kind of idiom, the turns mm -hmm. of phrase, things that will... You, I'm always trying to make the book sound as authentic as possible, that it will, it will read as if it could have been written at the time itself. And you come across phrases which you know, are not used so much anymore. Marion, Will's sister in the book, talks about being thrown over by her fiancé. Mm -hmm. Now, if somebody's dumped by their fiancé now, they mm -hmm. don't talk about being thrown over. No. So it's, it's, it's trying to find as much of that language um, as possible to make it seem as authentic as possible because really any novel, uh, you want the reader to feel that it's, that it's true, that it, that it yes. is an honest piece of work. Mm -hmm. So language is incredibly important in that sense. And this has movie written all over it for me. Okay. I can see somebody optioning this to become a major film, like some of, like one of your others. Yes. Well, you know, the, the downside of having one of your books made into a film is that every book you write subsequently, there's always this question of whether it will or not get made into mm -hmm. a film. I think it's the most cinematic of my books, certainly. But very much. And it's you know, it's with some people at the moment, but it's it's not. Um, to be honest, that's not something I ever really think about. You know, I I, I write the book, I finish the book, I start the next book, and mm -hmm. I, I'm not a film director, I'm not a screenwriter, I don't have any ambitions in that that field. I, I just like writing novels. And it must be difficult to watch your work uh, go to the silver screen, in a sense, yeah. because you lose a bit of control. You do, but it's, uh, it's exciting at the same time. Mm. I mean, certainly with Boy in the Striped Pajamas, you know, it was my first experience of being on a movie set, you know, watching right. characters I had written back mm -hmm. home in Dublin suddenly acting in front of me. And it would be disingenuous to pretend that it wasn't <laughs> exciting. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, they always say that the... Um, the writer needs to learn to trust the, the filmmakers, but it's actually the other way around. They need to learn to trust you, that, that you, can, mm -hmm. you, can, you can let some of it go, that you can let them make the film that they want to make. And The Boy in the Striped Pajamas set in a Nazi concentration camp, true? Yes. Dur yes what was it about? I haven't read it. It's about a young German boy called Bruno, who's nine years old, who is taken away from home because his father is becoming commandant of a concentration camp. And he arrives at this camp and he goes exploring down the fence, and he meets this uh, young Jewish boy who's sitting every day on the other side of the fence. Mm -hmm. And they have conversations every afternoon, and the reader gradually learns what's going on, who these people are, what's taking place in this camp. And it was a book I wrote for young readers. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I, hadn't, I wasn't sure if you know, a story about the Holocaust would work for children, right. but I thought, you know, I could try it. Well, in a way, it would work beautifully for children because it's a way for them to understand. Yeah, I hope so. Because and uh, not forget. Well, with having two central characters who, who are nine years old in that book, mm -hmm. uh, I think what I was hoping was that young readers would actually relate to them in some way and go on a journey with them and care about them so that if something terrible was to happen to them, that they would, they would ask questions of why. Why, why does this have to happen? Mm. John Boyne, our guest, he's in town to uh, read, speak, yes, uh, communicate with uh, people tonight at 7.30 at the Vancouver Public Library, and we'll come back and talk more about The Absolutist and other things.